So welcome everyone to another crisis conversation live from the Better Life Lab. I'm Bridget Schulte. I'm the director of the Better Life Lab. Welcome once again to my home office. <laughs> uh, when we started these conversations, as you all know, we started uh, with the idea that we were all isolated and that this virus and pandemic was upending everything about how we work and live and our, and, uh, and our family life. Uh, and it was, a, it was an opportunity to come together to share stories. And now as it continues on week after week, we're really looking for understanding what is this virus showing, sort of the cracks in the system, uh, what can we learn and how can we emerge better and stronger. So today we're going to be talking about single parents. Um, uh, and we're gonna start with Allison. Uh, Allison, we had a, 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 an episode a couple weeks ago where we looked, we were talking about the gender division of labor at home that women are still um, doing twice the amount of housework and childcare, typically pre-pandemic. And it's really an open question about whether the pandemic is making things worse or if there's more sharing or if this is an opportunity to reset. And you got in touch with me and you said, that's all well and good, but what if you are a single parent? And we do live in a country where the majority of children are being raised uh, or, uh, you know, we have the most uh, single parent um, households for children in this country. So tell us, what, what was it like before the pandemic and how are you navigating and surviving in the pandemic? Absolutely, thank you so much for having me, Bridget. Um, my name is Allison Griffin. I um, am a single mom of two boys. They are 12 and 10. Um, let me just start off by saying, um, and this is something that I tell them, everyone has a story. Um, and people are single for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes they choose to be single. Um, sometimes divorce um, forces them to be single. They lose a spouse, they lose a partner. Um, and so I, I, I share my own story um, in the context of my own perspective and experience. Um, I will say the pandemic has upended routines that I had very carefully stitched together um, mm. over the last four years. Um, mm -hmm. I work remotely. I have worked remotely um, for 13 years. Uh, my current employer is based in Washington, DC. I live outside of Boulder, Colorado. Um, I travel frequently for my job. Um, my boys, I have a, a custody arrangement um, where my boys spend half the time with their dad and half the time with me. Um, and I will say up until about seven weeks ago, uh, the process of my life was very carefully stitched together. And mm -hmm. what um, the pandemic has shown me is where the fault lines lie um, in the system that I had constructed for myself. Um, my boys, uh, you know, of course, attend school full time, but they then partake in an after school program. So between the hours of 730 to 6. I have consistent childcare or school arrangements for them. Which makes, um, I imagine, makes being able to focus on work a whole lot easier. You can actually get it, you can actually get it done. Absolutely. And I would say over the last, well, so when, when all of this started, we were um, upon spring break and our schools um, closed for the week before spring break. And then of course we had spring break. So for two weeks, um, as we were sort of starting into a, a new normal, um, I had to figure out what my boys were going to do for that time. But I, I think I took for granted that um, we, <laughs> that we weren't going to be in that situation for very long. I speculated it might be a few weeks. Yeah. I certainly didn't expect that it would be months. And now as um, you know, the governor of Colorado has talked a lot about planning for the fall, um, and planning to possibly be online intermittently. Wow. And, and so, you know, I begin to think not just about the next three weeks, uh, school ends in 13 days. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what summer will look like, but then how this routine is really going to change mm -hmm. as I get into the fall semester. You know, one of the things that's, that, that strikes me, you talk for a lot of single parents, I mean, the time use research shows that single parents are among the most time starved and busy of all people on the planet, just because you have to do everything. And that you really rely on networks, networks of friends, networks of neighbors, informal and formal networks, uh, other family members. But in an era of social distancing, you, you have no network. It's, it's really all you, isn't it? That's right. Um, I've been talking to a lot of my friends who are in dual um, adult homes, you know, whether that's a spouse or a partner or a parent or a grandparent or a friend. Um, 
I don't have that luxury right now. It is me and my boys. And so what I've said to those who have another adult in the home, think of all the things you do and then think of all the things that the other adult does. Now take that other adult out of the scenario and you are now doing what both of you do. And so for me, um, you know, I'm helping with homework at the same time that I'm on, you know, five to six hours worth of conference calls or Mm. Zoom meetings. I'm resolving technology glitches when the, you know, my boys say the internet went down and I have to figure that out for all of us. Um, I have to go to the store during the day because the stores close at eight o'clock. And so I can't wait until eight or 10 at night to just run out to pick up a single item. Um, in Colorado, it snow, it snowed four times wow. since the beginning of March. So I'm you know, shoveling the walk while I'm helping with homework and thinking about dinner that night. Um, so to your point, there isn't anybody else who can, can pitch in. And um, you know, even in, in the pre-pandemic era, um, when I would rely on friends and family or I would pay a, a sitter, I can't have anyone else in the house to help me with those things right now. Right. You know, um, we're waiting for Nasus Davis to join. We've had some technical glitches, if, if some of you were wondering why we, we got a little late start. So hopefully Nasus will be joining us soon. Um, let me come back to you, Allison, because we were, we were talking about work, you know, and, and what single parents, so you're juggling all of these things. You don't have anyone else. Uh, and now you're doing homeschooling and, you know, taking care of children uh, on top of all of that. We have work cultures that typically really reward people who are work first and are able to, you know, um, work long hours or drop at the hat. Uh, what's that? What's it? Been, what's that been like for you in the pandemic to try to meet some of those um, kind of ideal worker norms, or or do you, you know, how does that affect single parents uh, in a way that maybe um, people with with more support don't have those kinds of expectations? Sure. So again, just speaking from my own experience, my work, you know, pre- even pre-pandemic was um, pretty, uh, um, not, not stressful, just challenging, right? Pretty demanding um, between travel and expectations. We were, I worked for a client services firm. And so, um, you know, being available to clients uh, whenever they need that support is just a, a function of my, my job. Um, you know, what has changed for me actually is, you know, given that I'd worked remotely for 13 years, a, a lot of my colleagues had not. Mm. And so now the, the norms that I had established for myself as a remote employee, um, our organization is having to adapt and uh, surface new norms for all of our team members who are working right. remotely. And I would say that, you know, that has created, it's, you know, created certainly a different work culture, but that's extended the day in a different way that I was not prepared for. Um, my day is starting earlier as I try and connect with colleagues um, sort of before the workday starts, the work extends into the evening. Um, and I think a lot of us have felt this, you know, we've lost track of days and time um, as all of these activities have blurred together. Yeah. And I would say, um, you know, the same is, has been true for me, but more so because um, everyone is, is working at a different pace and at different hours because they are mm. juggling and managing families in a different way. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for that, Allison. It looks like we've got Nasus on the line now. So if we could, I'd love to go to you, Nasus. You know, when we spoke, we were talking uh, when I was doing reporting around health and health workers. You're a nurse practitioner in the Chicago area. And then you also became a foster mother to three very young children early on, uh, just as the pandemic was starting to hit. So can we go to Nasus? Um, uh, um, let's see, I, are, are you there, Nasus? Can you tell us your story? I'm here. Oh, great. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. So okay. this is, uh, yeah, tell us your story. So you, uh, you went from, uh, you know, working, uh, being a nurse practitioner and working in the middle of this pandemic to working in the middle of this pandemic and all of a sudden being a mother to three children on your own. Tell us what it's been what like for you. Uh, a total nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, I came from not having any responsibility but myself uh, to having responsibility for now four of us. Um, the kids are through the DCFS services, but they are not helpful at all. Either that or they did not 
plan for ever having any kind of state of emergency situation. Mm. Uh, I had to figure out babysitting on my own because of the simple fact that all of the daycares closed. But when they closed, the I was informed that the DCFS daycare center was not supposed to close to these children. Well, that was a joke. Mm. So I have missed work. I've missed money. I've... Uh, DCFS would not answer their phones. <laughs> wow. They did not return any of my calls when I did reach out to numbers that I did have until I called like Springfield to get information. And finally, I reached somebody who was not even on my case. Mm-hmm. And she kind of helped me through, which was a little bit helpful, but I still struggle with the fact that um, I have more than one mouth to feed now still. Uh, my job itself uh, is not that that helpful um, and being understanding that uh, I didn't cause this pandemic. Um, and so when I need time off for these kids, because I have no one to watch them, uh, they kind of don't understand that. And that's been a huge nightmare. Mm. Um, Money wise, it's been very tight. Again, I have more than one mouth to feed, and milk is not free out there. Uh, Neither are the services, obviously. Um, And when you try to go into places, I think I heard one of the um, people on here say something about, you know, not being able to make it to the store until 8 o'clock, but the stores have closed. Well, yeah, that ours here in Chicago, we're closing at 5 o'clock. So if I didn't get out, uh, pack the kids up and have somebody help me uh, or sit in the car um, while I run in because, of course, you don't want to take the children in. They're only uh, five-month-old twins and then a 15-month-old. Wow. Then it's kind of scary because how are they going to eat for the rest of the night? I mean, you know. Uh, so, so Nasus, you were saying, ahead. so, is, you know, so you have these three three children two five-month-old twins and, you know, a, a baby just over one, it sounds like. Uh, and when the child care center closed, you know, uh, what did you do? You know, were you able to get like the emergency paid family and medical leave that Congress passed? That was supposed to help people in your situation. When you know, you know, the child care closed down, did you, were you able to, to use that or what did you do? So, um again with that ha 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 i laugh at that um <laughs> they got on tv and they talked about how you were supposed to have free health care, i mean free um child care if you were a frontline worker well they gave a website that was already up and running prior to the pandemic which was not free you had to put your credit card on there well if i'm not working i sure don't have money on my credit card yeah um and then nobody could like step you through it. You call, you try to call around uh, to get help to go through the website. Not helpful at all. They're like, yeah, well, here's a website and just go figure it out. So what did you, so, what did you, what did you end up doing to, you know, to, to get childcare so you could go back to work? Honestly, I had to fly one of my friends in from out of state who uh, was, not working due to this same pandemic. Um, So I haven't even been able to pay her really, but because she's a good friend, she's been here with the kids, um, helping to take care of them and uh, do things for them. Uh, From time to time, my boyfriend, when he's not out going to look for a certain work, he's here helping out too. I mean, but it's been a total joke. You know, have you it's had, been a total did you, did you have any like paid sick days that you could use to, to, to cover the time? I had absolutely have- nothing. <laughs> I had no paid sick time. And the reason why is because I had a mother that just recently had a kidney. So I was off with her mm-hmm. prior to the, prior to receiving these kids. Yeah. And so I had no more sick time uh, for a family leave or anything. So all of these days that I've been off, have been literally out of my own pocket. My savings is like completely depleted. My credit score went from a 700 now to the 500. <laughs> so wow. 
I mean, I've been trying to make ends meet. And when I, like I said, when I reach out to DCFS, no help, no help whatsoever. Um, and the money that I spent out, I said, hey, could you guys at least reimburse me for that? Maybe I can make it a few more weeks. They tell me, well, you should have just told us what you needed and we would have got it for you um, because we don't plan on, we don't, we don't, we're not going to honor these receipts. I said, well, that's not what you told me when you dropped these kids off. <laughs> well, no, sis, thank you for so, sharing that. You're, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but it does sound like a nightmare, but thank you for sharing your story. You know, we'll come back to you in a minute, but at this point, let me go to Nicole. Um, Nicole, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, you, you run a, an amazing project where you look at families and, and kind of 21st century families. You, you know, you've heard Allison talk about uh, all of the, the additional pressure that single parents face in a pandemic and Nasus' story where she, you know, if we're looking at how uh, the pandemic is showing the cracks in the system, she has fallen through every single one of them. So, you know, Nicole, what are you seeing out there? What are single parents struggling with? And, and what is this showing in terms of our system um, that isn't working and that does need to change? Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, I think the short answer is that all of our systems to support families are broken. Um, uh, and if anything, this has made that um, even more crystal clear. Um, I think it's very, it's very clear that uh, nobody raising children survives on their own. Everybody needs help. And I think what has happened to um, people like um, you, Nasus, during in the midst of this is really a disgrace. Um, and, you know, the only good I can hope from any of this is it's a wake up call to everybody that um, we're all interdependent. Nobody is an island. Nobody is completely self-reliant. And our policies um, and institutions have failed entirely to keep us afloat. And, you know, I, I, I think one thing I've been thinking a lot about in the midst of this is, um, you know, the what's been so dangerous about the idea um, that is so this sort of cultural idea that sort of two married parent families, nuclear families are um, these sort of self-contained and self-reliant units that don't need anybody else. And, and that's why, you know, um, that's why they're, they're something we should desire. And the reality is that even for two parent families, there, there's everybody requires outside help, whether that's paid help, paid domestic labor, or whether that's just friends and family and neighbors stepping in, mm -hmm. it is not possible to work and raise children with no other help. And, you know, I think one thing when it comes to um, single parents who are, you know, a quarter of children are being raised by single parents. Yeah. And I think the, what has always struck me as really in the sort of the most insulting idea that people sometimes carry about single parents um, is this idea that somehow the reason to discourage single parenthood or the reason not to support single parents is, well, they'll become dependent on the system. Yeah. Well, first of all, look at a person like Nazis. Um, she's taken in and is trying to raise three children. If that's not being the opposite of, that is helping the world in an incredible way, first exactly, of all. Exactly. Um, but I think, you know, what's so crazy to me is that if this moment doesn't prove to us that it doesn't even work for those nuclear family homes, I mean, how do we expect it to work for single parents? It doesn't work for anybody. Um, and single parents are the front lines of so much of this. And the fact that, you know, we can pass a stimulus bill that gives dual income earners, that gives homes with two parents who are both earning incomes twice as much money yeah. as really single parents right. is in itself, I think, an outrage. I mean, what we know about single parents versus two parent homes is that if you have two parents, you tend to have, not always, but you almost always have more savings, more income, and more hands to help. So if anything, in this moment, single parents should be getting at least as much, if not more 
than dual in income earner families. Mm -hmm. And yet, just in the way that our policies tend to be punitive in general towards families outside of some nuclear kind of idealized norm, um, we're doing it in the way we support um, single parents, or I should say not support single parents in this case. I mean, it, it, it's, it actually strikes me as um, almost comically outrageous that, that, that essential workers are often exempt from a lot of the stimulus support Right. And a lot of them are single parents. So we're telling people, and I'm assuming that Nasus, you might be considered an essential worker because you're a, a nurse practitioner. We're telling people you're exempt. You have to go, you need to go to work. Um, you don't get paid time off. You have to go to work. And Congress never provided any backup for those families when it came to child care. I mean, right. that is putting everybody in an absolutely impossible position and it was never good before the pandemic but it is truly impossible for people now thank you so much nicole you know at this point um we've got ann hoffman on the line she's one of the participants uh ann are you there um, you tell us your story oh, yep i'm here hi uh, my name hi. is ann hoffman i am a single parent um but i also I teach at a community college and my research area is actually on um, single mothers. And so many of my students who I work with, I don't work exclusively with single moms, but um, I can tell you my life has upended in the last um, eight weeks, very similarly to Allison's in that um, I have a shared custody agreement with my ex-husband, but he's an essential worker. He's, um, mm -hmm. He's a, he's a physician. So I am aware that um, I'm in a very different financial position than my students who are struggling right now. Um, but my life, like I said, has upended in the sense that I don't have a 50-50 custody arrangement right now because my, my kiddos need to be with me right. um, because my ex-husband is working um, full-time kind of around the clock. So um, I have this perspective in sort of understanding while um, my life is really hard and uh, and it's just very difficult to focus right now, to be honest, yeah. and help my kiddos through their uh, their coursework and the things that they're working on here. Thank God I've got you know kiddos who don't have um, special needs. That's a whole nother layer. But um, my students are not in that same position. Many of them are essential workers. They're trying to juggle going to school, taking care of their kiddos, many of whom are, are, are very quite young. Um, and they're putting themselves at risk each day and there are no safety nets for, for their protection um, in terms of um, you know, paid time off, um, even uh, you know, healthcare mm -hmm. for them because of their part-time, if they're going to school part-time, many of them are also working part-time. Yeah. So I'm just so aware of the vulnerabilities of this population and it's, um, it's terrifying to watch. As scary as it, is, as it is for me to walk through as a single mom, I'm just aware that there are many people in much worse positions than I am and aware of the way that this rupture in our country is revealing um, so many of the, um, revealing a crisis that has always existed, but is now yeah. visible because people who are in more privileged positions are feeling the crunch as well. Right, exactly. Thank you so much for sharing that, Anne. Let me go back to you, Nicole. You know, so here we've got this pandemic that's showing us these, these ruptures ac across race and class in particular. So what do we do? What do we learn? What should we do moving forward? What are, you know, what are some policies and how do we design them? You know, what are some things that need to change in our culture in terms of, of you know, what we, uh, how do we remove some of the stigma? You know, how do, we, how do we accept 21st century families and support all of them in whatever form they, uh, they choose to be configured in? How many hours do we have? <laughs> <laughs> we got a few more minutes. That's about it. No, um, I mean, there is, you know, a lot to do. Um, you know, I think there's some obvious policy fixes and they're not going to be easy, but I think if we haven't realized how critical they are now, I don't know when we will. Um, you know, on the policy front, obviously, um, we need paid family leave for everyone. We need paid sick leave. Um, we need to use the broadest definition of family in those bills. So we need to make sure that when we say you can take leave for your family, that family includes foster children, that it includes family-like relationships, chosen family, et cetera. We need free or affordable health care for all that is not attached to employment. And I'll add, one of the things Family Story works on, not attached to marriage. The idea that somehow any of your benefits are contingent upon or 
um, reliant on a marriage is is a is a really crazy idea that no no other you know none of our peer countries ever would consider. Yeah, even our even our tax policy it it favors um, not only um, uh, you know uh, heterosexual married couples it also favors breadwinner homemaker couples that we really haven't seen since the nineteen yeah. fifties. There is a, yeah, it's stuck in the, there's a few of our policies that are literally stuck in the 1950s. None of them have evolved enough, but things like tax policy, which favor the sort of breadwinner homemaker dynamic, um, married parents, um, and, uh, and also um, things like social security. I mean, you can live and raise children your whole life with a partner that you are not married to, but is just just like a married partner, and they can't collect your survivor benefits. I mean, there, there's no real good reason for things like that. So things like that have to change. And I would say in general, anything, any benefits that's conditioned um, on a particular family relationship, like a marriage, is not really a good one because that is, those are things that ebb and flow and change in people's lives. You can't assume everybody will get married, that they'll stay married, that their marriage will be good, that they won't have to leave for a variety of often very dangerous reasons even. So that's that's the, the sort of policy fix front. And I think on the sort of um, institutional front in our workplaces, you know, we have to walk the walk. We can't just say well, balance is important. We have to think particularly, I think one thing I hear all the time from single parents is, you know, there's a few particular workplace practices that make single parenting completely impossible. One is things like um, just in time scheduling, not being able to know your schedule in advance is impossible if you're trying to plan care. It also makes your finances impossible. Absolutely. And the other thing is even for higher income earners who are single parents who have more professional kind of white collar class jobs, the expectation that they travel and that they do evening events without stipends or anything to sort of help uh, buffer that, assumes they have somebody else who can care for their children in the evenings and when they travel. And that's not the case either for a lot of people. Why don't we give people stipends for, for childcare in those cases? Um, and I think in general, the only last point I'd say is, you know, the major change we need going forward is we need to stop sort of assuming there's this hierarchy of family types that work the best, that we're all to have a similar one and that the goal is for everybody to get there because it's just not reasonable and it's not what everybody wants and even if they want it it's not what everybody gets yeah yeah great point you know we have liz willen uh is an old friend of mine i'm so thrilled that you're here we we're in uh, graduate school together i'm afraid to say how many years ago um liz you've been writing a lot about um uh, the single parent challenge is going to college. I'd love to hear your perspective uh, and what you're what you're writing about and what you're seeing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I spent the week talking to single parents, most of them who are students at community colleges. And I was trying to figure out how to make people understand just how vulnerable this population is um, already. And I, it started with I got a, a study came to my desk that showed that um, even before this crisis, one in five, there's one in five college students are, are parents, by the way. That is wow. not a statistic that anybody really thinks about and wow. or is aware of. And um, now they're trying to navigate education at the same time as, um, think about it, it's a perfect storm, right? Their daycares are closed. Mm -hmm. um, if, and maybe they're working. If one of the women I spoke with was, was working at a Waffle House. Now she's only able to work one day a week on takeout and her friend and she and her friend are trading off uh, for childcare on those other days. Wow. Childcare is closed, schools are closed, and they're also trying to homeschool their children while finishing their education. We wow. already had a college completion crisis in this country, particularly community colleges have abysmal rates. But now for this population, it's so challenging. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece that we really haven't discussed here is the lack of internet. And a lot of the community right. colleges that I spoke to realized as they tried to reach out to students to help, how few had hotspots, iPads, um, computers. And if they did, think about the competition. You've got a couple of kids working on um, trying to do their remote schooling and the parents are trying to do their work as well, or at least their schoolwork. So I, I heard a lot of challenges, but the one thing I can tell you that was really heartwarming about that story was that um, a lot of community colleges are doing a great deal to help these students. There's food banks, 
set up. They're calling regularly. They're doing video chats. They're obviously highly invested in keeping this population in school. But mm -hmm. the irony struck me of being a single parent going back to school. The, the woman at the Waffle House, Anisha Thomas, that I was telling you about is 35 years old, decided to go back to school to be an example for her children, single mom. And something like this happens, and she just said, I can't do this. I can't do this too. Mm -hmm. And everyone just got together there and said, we'll give you extensions. We'll help you. You've got to finish. Yeah. And um, so she's staying in school. That was heartening. Well, that's, yeah, but, but look at, uh, she's bearing so much of that load on her own shoulders. Allison, I saw you nodding vigorously. Let's go to you. What, <laughs> what were you, what's going through your mind as you're hearing some of these stories? Well, actually, just even as Liz was talking, um, you know, a lot of the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis is um, in the higher education space. And so, um, especially Liz illuminating, you know, who today's students really are and the fact that, yes, one in five are parents, um, you know, they're managing school and home and, and child care responsibilities. And I think, you know, the thing I'd like to at least maybe leave, lead, leave with um, from my perspective is, you know, I think we have to be really careful about, you know, not making policy around just anecdote, but mm. to really dive into the data. Um, I know there's, there's work being done by um, Imaginable Futures. Um, they have a, and they're working with a lot of other organizations on the RISE Prize. Um, to begin to elevate solutions for not just student parents um, in, you know, in college, but um, you know, parents across the board who are trying to support education and, and family at the same time. Um, and I think if we can begin to gather data from you know, so many different sources, but you know, like a USA Facts, right, who they are culling data um, from government sources, um, both on single parents, but also on COVID response. And how do we begin to, to bring some of that data together to mm -hmm. actually inform a lot of the solutions that Nicole was talking about? Um, we have an incredible opportunity right now to, yeah. to, to tell these stories in a pretty powerful way. And hopefully make some really powerful change. Well, I'd love to, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. I'd love to, to go back to you, Nasus. Um, you know, here, here you are, you've been through this nightmare but you know, opened your home to, to three children who really needed, the, needed your help. You know, as, you, you know, as you're dealing with the pandemic and moving into the future, you know, what do you think that single parents need? You know, what do we need to be learning and where do we need to go from here? Honestly, uh, especially workers who are considered essential, <laughs> they should have a, um, a stimulus package set aside for them so that you can be able to uh, help the people that's in your household. And you won't have those, those worries on top of, am I gonna get sick just to go out and help somebody else? Yeah. Trying to work, uh, trying to bring resources back into the home. Um, as far as them offering out different resources, it needs to be open to everyone and not just people who um, are not considered at a certain caliber. So like uh, nurses, for instance, who don't even uh, don't even count for the resources that you put out there. Um, Congress really does need to changes, big time changes. Um, they need to offer more hands on. Yeah. Truly offer more hands on and not just stand on the news <laughs> and say things that really do, does not exist. Yeah, you know, in, in your own experience. So, you know, you, you had said when we were talking earlier that, uh, you know, that you'd really wanted to become a mother. And so that's why you opened your home as a foster mother. You know, given this experience, is this something that you think you might do again? <sighs> That's a good question. <laughs> Honestly speaking, um, if I did it, it would totally be on my own. DCFS would not be involved. So that means that I would have set aside uh, the resources that I need to be able to take care of the children that I'm taking in. Um, I would never open up my home, and I hate to say that, I would never open up my home to do it through DCFS. And um, and be put in a position where I have to now kind of, it's like a, you know, sink or swim, like, are we going to be able to make it tomorrow? 
Um, or, and, and when your, your back is up against the wall, it makes you start to think crazy. Like, oh my God, I got all of these kids and me, I can't go to work because I have nobody to watch them. Mm-hmm. Um, almost made me want to take the kids into the job and just sit them at the, at the counter mm-hmm. <laughs> and say, here I am, I need to make money and you guys aren't helping me. So here we are as a family, we're going to try to do this together. Um, and, and, you, and you go to work in a hospital where you're caring for, for COVID patients, which is dangerous for you that and dangerous for them too. In the emergency room, that is correct. Mm. Um, and so to be perfectly honest with you, it, it kind of made me not ever want to go this route mm. ever again. And I, I hate to say that because there's so many kids in the system that need to be cared for, but when you're in a state of emergency, and Congress has the right to say, well, we're only going to help them, but we're not going to help them over here. Mm-hmm. That That's not a good look. Yeah. Not a good look at all. Well, thank, um, you, thank you so much for sharing your your story, Nasus and Allison. Nicole, thank you for, for coming and sharing your perspective, and Anne and Liz for sharing your stories as well. Thank all of you for, for being part of these conversations. Uh, helping us figure out what's going on and, and what we can learn and how we can emerge better and how we can support, you know, our single parents so that they don't, uh, they aren't in this sink or swim kind of a situation moving forward. Uh, I'd also like to thank the New America and the events team, my own Better Life Lab team, my producer, David Schulman. Thank you to all the participants for being here. Um, we hope you'll join us next week. We're going to be revisiting our, uh, the emergency paid sick days law, and we're going to be talking to Jody Heyman with the World Policy um, uh, uh, Research Center, and where they've looked at uh, paid sick leave policies all around the globe and how the U.S. stacks up. So we hope you'll join us then. And until then, wash your hands, stay healthy, safe, and sane, and we'll see you next week. Bye.